Welcome into this edition of QTV Sports This Week. I'm Shane Holsey. And I'm Alex Abishan. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, several QU teams that were supposed to play this fall now have their seasons in the spring. And we know the schedules of some more of those sports which have been subject to that fate. After a season that featured a three-win improvement under new head coach Mark Jones, the QU women's volleyball team entered 2020 with aspirations of competing in the upper echelon of the GLVC. Those aspirations will have to wait until 2021, but on a positive note, we will see volleyball at Pepsi Arena in a few short months. The new spring schedule in the GLVC begins the final week of January. The 15 teams in the conference will compete in three five-team divisions. Each team will contest 18 matches, playing each opponent inside its division twice and each opponent outside its division once. So what does the schedule look like for QU in particular? The Hawks will play their first three matches on the road beginning January 29th against William Jewell. Maryville comes to Pepsi Arena for the Hawks' first home match on February 12th, and QU will end the regular season the same way they started against William Jewell, this time at Pepsi Arena. That match will be April 9th with the GLVC tournament scheduled for the 15th through the 17th. The GLVC has also announced its men's and women's soccer schedules. The conference's 15 teams will compete in a 14-match single round robin schedule beginning February 26. Everybody plays everybody. The quarterfinals of the GLBC Championship Tournament will take place on April 19th, followed by the semifinals and finals April 23rd and 25th at Linden Woods Hunter Stadium in St. Charles, Missouri. As for the Hawks, they will begin their season the same day as the other 14 teams, February 26th with a road matchup with Maryville. They'll stay in the St. Louis area for a February 28th date with Linda Wood before coming home for the first time. Missouri, St. Louis, and McKendree will come to town March 5th and 7th. The final games for both the men and women will take place April 16th in Arala against Missouri S&T before the GLVC tournament kicks off the following week. In other QU Hawks athletic news, the men's and women's golf teams competed in the McKendree Bearcat Invitational in Fairview Heights, Illinois, Monday and Tuesday. The Hawks finished eighth in the dual gender event. TJ Winsing led the way on the men's side with an 18th place finish, going 73, 76, 74 for a combined 223. On the women's side, Hannah McGuire paced the Hawks with a 243. Coming up. There are no games for QU football in fall 2020. But there will be in spring 2021. QU head coach Gary Bass joins us next to talk spring football and more. Stick right with us. sport that often results in a tie. Student life comes with its own demands, and often it feels like the losses outnumber the wins. Sometimes you just need someone to listen. It's comforting to know our Quincy team extends beyond the field. to make it your cue for you to do what you love. 
Just because there are no QU football games this fall doesn't mean we can't talk a little pigskin. Here to chat it up, socially distanced here in the studio is QU head football coach Gary Bass. Coach, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. All right. So you've seen the schedule, the GLBC laid out mm -hmm. for spring 2021. Give me your thoughts about what spring football is going to look like Great Lakes Valley Conference. Well, it's going to be cold. <laughs> it's not going to be near the, uh, the warmth we're used to for sure. But uh, I know the biggest thing for us as head coaches when we sat down and we talked about wanting to build this schedule was trying to make sure that we kept our kids safe. Uh, I know having a five-game schedule in the spring uh, isn't exactly what we want um, from a length of time and the number of games for each kid, but having the ability to make sure we try to keep and limit the number of reps for those kids uh, just because of the injuries. I mean, it's so much easier um, from a football standpoint because of the physicality of the sport to get an injury, and the last thing you want to do is for have a kid lose uh, another year of eligibility because of an injury in the spring. So. Now, it almost goes without saying, and the phrase has almost been worn out by this point, but these have been some unusual times, especially <laughs> for someone like you yeah. being a college football coach. So what have your days consisted of being a coach during a pandemic, during a fall where there's no Q games? I would still imagine it's still as busy as ever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a different kind of busy in a lot of ways. I know uh, with trying to make sure when everything first started and getting everybody back, trying to make sure that we were COVID friendly and trying to make sure we were following all protocols by state, federal, and, and QU guidelines from that standpoint, Adams County Health Department. Just trying to make sure we keep our kids healthy and safe. Uh, as coaches, I know we did a lot of troubleshooting trying to figure out different ways that we could, one, maximize the ability to be able to get onto the field, get into the weight room and things of that sort while keeping our kids healthy and safe. But I mean, it's definitely been challenging in a lot of rights. I, I definitely think it's also made recruiting that much more interesting. <laughs> uh, you've got a, a totally different recruiting cycle than normal from a standpoint of not playing any games. You have the ability to have people on campus and a lot of, a lot of rights. And uh, once the division, the division two lifted the, the dead period and we could start bringing people on campus, it was nice to, to be able to show them a little bit more about what Quincy's about. So it's been a little bit different busy. And what, what have those recruiting visits been like? Uh, it's definitely been a lot different from a standpoint of usually when we do our officials, you're talking overnight visits. You're talking about a lot of time spent with the kids because of the COVID stuff right now. You, you one, you don't want to subject uh, the people here on campus to someone being here for an extended period of time. So that was the first thing we had to do. Uh, and the second thing was trying to make sure that we didn't expose the people that were coming on the campus possibly to someone that could have it as well by chance. So trying to shrink them down, make them a lot more uh, individualized instead of having five or 10 people at different things. Uh, only having one or two. That way you can get in for three or four hours, get what you need to get done, and, and, and be able to get them on their way. So they've been nice in a lot of ways, though. Absolutely, absolutely. And props to everybody involved for making all that happen. Now, you guys won five games last mm -hmm. year. You guys have improved every single year. You've been the head coach the last few years. Now, obviously, you can't improve on that win total because you're only going to play four games mm -hmm. that count this year. So what are, what are going to be some signs that you're going to look for come spring of improvement in this team? Well, the other good thing about only playing five is it gives us, since we're only playing half our season, no one loses a year of eligibility. Uh, so even if our freshmen do get on the field this spring, that regardless of the number of reps, no one's going to use a year of eligibility. So we're going to have the ability, in my opinion, one, to be able to see a lot of the young kids get on the field. Um, we want to win. We're going to try to win as many as we can. Uh, but it definitely makes you feel a little bit better as a coach knowing, hey, look, if we don't get a freshman on the field more than 15 or 20 snaps, it's not the end of the world. You didn't burn his red shirt. So for us, a lot of it's going to dictate how many people are we allowed to have? Are they going to shrink the number of people we can take to away games from 60 down to 50? Are they going to shrink the number of people we can dress from a home game, which you usually dress somewhere around 75 or 80, down to 50? So, I mean, a lot of that's going to depend on that. But for our guys, it's one, it's one thought process only. The, the biggest thing we wanted to do as coaches was still give our guys the ability to play for a conference championship. And if we can win uh, our first three games, we will have the ability to not only play for a conference championship, but we'll have the opportunity to play for a comp conference championship here in Quincy, which will be awesome. Well, we're, we're looking forward, cert looking forward to it, certainly. And it's just exciting to have QU football back, knowing it's going to be back, even if it's just for a few games. Now, for those of you who may not know, Coach Bass here is a Tennessee Titans fan and coach. Mm -hmm. Yes, Derrick Henry, baby. <laughs> Their Titans moved to 5-0 and overtime victory over the Houston Texans on Sunday. And Tennessee is one of only three undefeated teams left, along with the Steelers and Seahawks. So Titans are still undefeated. How about that? Hey. I'll take it any day. Right now we're getting to watch so much more football with it being a normal uh, 
not a normal season for us. So it's kind of cool to be able to sit back and watch more football as a coach, be a little bit more of a fan. How, how about this run right here? How good was this? Well, Derrick Henry is a man. <laughs> he is a large human that can run. And watching someone that big, they should not be able to run like that. <laughs> that, so. that just defies the laws of physics, if yes. you're asking me. Well, hopefully the Titans can keep it rolling. Another tough game this week against undefeated Steelers. Hopefully the Titans can keep it rolling and keep it rolling on into January and who knows, maybe February. It'd be awesome. Be awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Coach. Always a pleasure. Me. Hopefully, we can catch up again soon. Thank you. All righty. So, we have another big man in charge joining the show when we come back. Coach Eric Rupel of the QU men's lacrosse team will join us after the break. Stick right with us. is um, exercise science, human performance, and basically that is going to set me up to get certified um, in strength and conditioning uh, and personal training. So ultimately what I want to do after college is put my personal training career off to the side and um, join the military. For this upcoming summer I have the opportunity to join uh, the platoon leaders course and basically what this is, is uh, for the Marine Corps, is Officer Candidate School. Um, it's a 10-week program in uh, Quantico, Virginia. And if I get accepted, I will uh, leave on June 1st, and I will train there for 10 weeks up until August 10th. My initial uh, physical standards, and that consists of a three-mile timed run, uh, two minutes to perform as many uh, pull-ups as I can, and two minutes to perform as many sit-ups as I can. Birth of lacrosse at Quincy University happened less than eight short months ago. However, after just two weeks after their first game on January, or February 26th, the QU men's lacrosse team had its inaugural season cut short. They only played five games, the last of which was March 12th in Huntsville, Alabama. But on Sunday, for the first time in 226 days, lacrosse in a game setting was played at QU Stadium. The Hawks held their first inter-squad scrimmage of the fall on Saturday. Gold team against the white team. Let's get it on. We picked things up early second quarter, tied at two. Some nice ball movement here by the gold team. And Preston Wil Wilman with a nice little spin move to get some room to shoot. And he finishes to put gold on top, 3-2. Just a couple minutes later, the gold team would add yet another. This time it's the Saskatchewan native Grayson Kwan. He fires one from a long way out. And it's a 4-2 gold lead. Late second quarter now, same score. Freshman Jamie Brain. Give me those ankles, young man. What a goal from the newcomer. He brings the white team within one at 4-3. Let's take another look at this beauty in slow-mo. Oh, man, that's just dirty. You can't do it to him like that. Then a rifle of a shot. We got ourselves a one-goal game. Late third quarter now, White has taken a 5-4 lead, but not for long. Mason Marano with the feet in front of Wilman. And the Minneapolis native ties the game at five. Nice quick release there from Wilman, but Team White would strike back in the final seconds of the quarter. Neil Dardis is going to draw the double team. You know what that means. Somebody's got to be open, and it's Parker Tony. He gives Team White a 6-5 lead heading into the fourth quarter, but the final quarter would belong to Team Gold. Six minutes to go, all tied up at six. Kyle Strachantra with the gorgeous feed. To Wilman in front, and he finds the back of the net once again. 7-6 goal. Let's take an another gander at that absolute dive from Sushantra. Surveys, surveys, and Wilman in stride, cutting to the net. Team goal takes the lead. And how about one more 
for good measure from Wilman. Under two minutes to play. This time it's Quan finding Preston in front of the net, and that is just too easy for Mr. Wilman. He puts this one on ice and seals an 8 6 victory for Team Gold over Team White. We now welcome onto the desk the head coach of QU Men's Lacrosse, socially distanced here in the studio, Coach Eric Ripple. Coach, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, not a bad showing for the first scrimmage of the fall. What did you like out of what you saw on Saturday? Goals. Uh, the boys came back with a passion. They've been practicing for the last four weeks. They've been really fixing some of the errors that they made last year. We've got some freshmen that came ready to ball, and they just wanted to put on a show for their friends and family back home. Absolutely. Now we talked back in spring in April about this, the spring season getting cut short and COVID-19 and all that. And one of the things you said was that the practices would be even more high energy, more high tempo, because these athletes realize this really, really could be the last time I step on this field. Is that something you've noticed more energy, more intensity in these fall practices? Oh, absolutely. And not even in the big things. It's the little things. It's the 6 a.m. weightlifting. It's the conditioning. It's grinding through practice and individual group work. Having the field taken away from you like that and then going home and not being able to do anything, not being able to go to the gym, in some cases not even being able to go outside, uh, the minute they came back to campus, they were ready to go, uh, ready for it. And just with a little bit of a renewed vigor that you don't necessarily see every time from a college athlete. You'll see them from the freshmen because they're excited to get on campus. But some of the veterans, this is going with the motion, and there's absolutely no going with the motion with these boys. They want every single rep. They want every single practice. They want every single weightlifting session they can. They just want it so badly because now we know what it's like to have it taken away. They're fully bought in, 100% ready to get better. Now, something else we talked about back in April and something else you mentioned was having a tough mentality to be able to handle something like a global pandemic. And how has this team, including yourself even, been able to have that tough mentality and get back on the field? When you got back on the field, you're, you're doing something right. Oh, it absolutely takes willpower. Uh, when they got forced into some quarantine, you know, they couldn't go outside. They couldn't see their normal friends in their cities across America. They had each other. So I'm sure there was a lot of group chatting and FaceTiming going along. I, uh, I know firsthand that Fortnite was very popular in about April and May. And that just kind of brought the team together in a way that you wouldn't have expected. And so when they got back to campus and saw each other for the first time in months, uh, they were just absolutely invigorated and ready to go. And our missions never changed. They knew year one would be hard. They knew year two would be hard for different reasons. And just adding this to it will make it a little difficult. But the trade-off is the buy-in from the team and their devotion to each other on and off the field. Well, it's certainly evident so far. And one last thing before, I, before we let you go. What are you going to look for in your team as we head through the fall and eventually into a spring season? Uh, keep their heads down. Keep grinding. What's going to be really interesting this year is we go home so much sooner. Uh, we'll still come back a little bit early and on time. Most of the athletes will. But there is an extended period of time where, you know, some of them still won't be able to do anything. You know, our Canadians still won't be able to go to a gym and some of our California kids still won't be able to go outside. So they're going to have to make do with a, a modified winter workout that's home based or find a cage in the backyard or just do whatever they can to stay in shape because our first game will come very quickly in the spring and we'll only have them on campus for a few short weeks. So they're gonna have to be motivated. They're gonna have to have some willpower to you know, get up off the couch and go run a little bit because January 11th will hit hard and we need them ready to go. Keep the nose to the grindstone as they say. Absolutely. Well, coach, thanks for taking some time. Hopefully we can chat it up again soon when we get a spring season going here at QU. Absolutely. Under the lights at QU Stadium, hopefully. Nothing better than that. Well, Coach, that's all the time we have for with him, but we're still rolling on this edition of QU TV Sports this week. Highlights from Game 1 of the Fall Classic coming up when we come back. World Series is here.
college shouldn't be as hard as understanding fine art. Use the resources here at Quincy University. We're here to help. Finding your passion is easy at Quincy University. Whether you're pursuing a bachelor's degree or looking to go even further, at QU, your professional and academic future is bright. 40 undergrad programs include moments that become experiences, connections that become careers, and relationships that become lifelong support. We want you here. That's why we work hard to ensure that a Quincy University education is affordable. Let us help you put together a plan. Visit discover.quincy.edu to get started. In a year full of uncertainty and in a sport full of unpredictability, it seems quite ironic to have the MLB teams with the two best records in the regular season in the World Series. The Dodgers are the favorites and have been since spring training, but they have no easy task in their opponent from the American League, the Tampa Bay Rays. The team with the third lowest payroll in the league, the team that takes a bunch of baseball average Joes and just finds a way to get it done. Rays Dodgers, Game 1, Globe Life Field, let's get right to it. Who else but Clayton Kershaw getting the start for the Dodgers? Top of the first, Rays with a couple runners on, and it's Manuel Margot with the slow chopper up the third baseline. Kershaw spins and fires to get Margot at first base. The Rays threat is over, but Kershaw's counterpart, Tyler Glasnow, was dealing early. Glasnow strikes out the side in the bottom of the third, fanning Austin Barnes, Mookie Betts, and Justin Turner, we're scoreless through three, but it wouldn't stay scoreless for long. Bottom of the fourth, one on for Cody Bellinger, and he turns around 98 into the Dodger bullpen to put the Dodgers on top, two to nothing. How about that shot from Bellinger? A little more modest celebration right there. Looks like the shoulder's okay, a big time swing there from the bopper. The Rays would get a run back the very next inning. Kevin Kiermeyer, injured wrist and all, gets a hanging slider from Kershaw, and he doesn't miss it. Betts gives it a look, but it sails out of here. Rays cut the deficit. It's 2-1. Bottom of the fifth now. Dodgers getting aggressive on the base paths. Betts and Corey Seager with the double steal to put runners on second and third for Max Muncy with the infield drawn in. Muncy's going to ground one over to the first base. Yandy Diaz tries to cut Betts down at the plate, but Betts slides around the tag. The Dodger lead doubles. It's now 3-1. Later in the inning. 5-1, Kike Hernandez rips one through the 5-6 hole. Will Smith comes around to score from second, and the lead has swelled. It's 6-1. Kershaw didn't need much help tonight, but he would get it from his defense anyway. In the sixth, Diaz chops one to third, and it's Justin Turner. The dive, the pick, the throw, the out. Ginger power on display there, Shane. How about that play from Turner? He snares it on the shortstop, and how about that throw from his knees? An absolute strike. To Muncy, Yandy Diaz. No, sir. Kershaw loves it. Yes, sir. Kershaw loving what he's seen from his defense. He'd have six strong here, giving up just one run. Bottom of the six now. New pitcher Josh Fleming is greeted by Betts with a shot to right field. Not the longest home run you'll ever see, but it'll get over the wall. 7 1 Dodgers, top of the seventh. Rays trying to make it interesting. But Victor Gonzalez says, not so fast. How about that double play? An absolute rocket off the bat of Mike Zanino and it turns into an inning-ending twin killing. That was the beginning of the end for the Rays. The Dodgers go on to win 8-3 and take game one of the Fall Classic in convincing fashion. So the Dodgers get it done in game one, and uh, they're, they're really looking like the favorites, wouldn't you say? They really are, especially with that game one showing, and how good did Kershaw look mm -hmm. last night? My word, six innings, two hits, one run, eight strikeouts. He really looked like vintage Kershaw, but don't sleep on these Rays. They're a darn good squad. I think this will be a long series. Should be a fun one. Oh, it definitely should be a fun one. I'm looking forward to the next week of sports. You know who else is looking forward to the next week? The man who called game one of the World Series last night on Fox, Joe Buck. We'll tell you why when we come back.
Quincy University's ResLife community is here to help you. A broadcaster's schedule can be a little hectic at times. But Joe Buck takes that to a whole new level. Take a look at this. This is Joe Buck's schedule from Sunday the 18th through Thursday the 29th. Buck called football on Sunday and Monday and game one of the World Series on Tuesday. He will call game two of the World Series tonight, football on Thursday, the World Series on Friday and Saturday, and Sunday if the World Series goes to a fifth game. He'll have Monday off, mercifully, and then if the World Series goes seven games, he'll have game six and seven, the 27th and 28th, then Thursday night football on the 29th. That is potentially 11 games in 12 days for Mr. Buck. And seven baseball games and four football games. It's not like he's calling the same sports. That's just insane schedule. Can't imagine what that's going to be like. Oh, it's crazy. I really can't imagine. I guess you'll just, you know, have to ask him in the two hours of free time he's going to have. I guess so. He's not going to have much of it, but we'll, we'll try to get to him. Let, him. let him know how he's doing. That's all the time we have for on this edition of QTV Sports this week for Alex Albashon. I'm Shane Holsey. Just a few shows left this semester. We're almost in November already. Whew. Crazy, crazy. We'll see you next time. Take care. Stay safe, everybody.